I think confidence is just being sure of who you are. Welcome to Thriving in the Wild. I'm Taylor Stern. I'm sharing what happens when you step into your vulnerability, face the hard things, celebrate your journey, and giving you your weekly reminder that no one has it all figured out. It's time to thrive. Let's go. Hi friends, welcome into another episode of the Thriving in the Wild podcast. The voice you just heard was Jenna Sims, our friend, model, and actress, and she talks about confidence in her own life and how she's also used that to help her pageant of hope. So we'll have our conversation featured a little bit later in the episode. But before we get there, Alex and I wanted to talk about this wild of confidence and what it looks like and what it means. And honestly, as we started breaking it down, we realized that true confidence is really owning who you are. So Alex, what does owning who you are mean to you? Now looking back through pretty much every season where I either dealt with insecurity or self-doubt, I really understand that confidence is so much to do with an internal journey more than any kind of external journey. Yeah. What does that mean? Exactly. You know, confidence isn't brought by the perfect fitness plan or the perfect outfit or the perfect lifestyle. True, real, genuine confidence that people can feel when you're in the room with them is so much rooted in someone's self-awareness, really looking inside. Self-assurance. Yeah, self-assurance and and self-belief. Yeah. Because it's it truly, it's like when you are shining with true confidence, it shines from the inside out. Yeah. And everybody feels it when it is genuine. Who's a person or like role model that you think does that the best? I remember when I was like really struggling with insecurity and self-doubt, probably the most around the tail end of like college and my like very, very early 20s, like 2021. 20, I looked up so much to Ashley Graham. Oh, me too. Because you were the one that... I was obsessed with her. Yeah, you were like, oh my gosh, you have to look up this person. She's so inspiring. She's so... Did you see her TED Talk first? Yeah, I think you sent that. Oh my gosh. It changed my life. Yeah, because she just... She helped to truly change the perspective on what confidence is. She wasn't trying to peddle diets to people. She wasn't trying to talk about ways everybody should fix themselves. Mm -hmm. She was standing up there basically saying, hey, I am so imperfect and I'm never going to be someone that you should look at for an example of, you know, perfect hair, perfect skin, perfect body or whatever. I'm someone here who's telling you that when you literally let yourself off the hook and love the skin you're in with the daily practice, you are going to feel incredible because I feel incredible. Yeah. Yeah. So I I think I'd come across her TED Talk and if you haven't seen it, we'll link it below because it's a must watch for everyone, man or woman. Just what she talks about is exactly what Alex is saying. She talks about, she kind of opens it up and she's looking into a mirror Mm -hmm. and she looks in the mirror and says, you are beautiful, you're brave and all of these self- self-love positive affirmations Mm -hmm. that she genuinely tells herself every time she looks in the mirror you knew she believed them oh you could feel it like you said and so she's looking in the mirror talking about that and then she talks about the fact and and you can see it right you know point blank she's wearing a a more form-fitting dress and she's just a curvy woman i mean i think she's what size i don't know exactly what size but she talks about how that doesn't even matter that like throw away the sizes throw away the scales whatever it is the beauty that's inside of her radiates outside yeah and when you see her and when you listen to her you can feel that yeah and i think what you're saying too like her message goes so beyond just being able to relate to other women but it's even with men you know I think even when it's like a celebrity or someone in the media who talks about a mental health struggle, that's a man. Yeah. It destigmatizes this belief that confidence in that whole journey has to look the same for everybody. But it's so different. 
I think the phrase one size fits all is very restricting. Yeah. It's very restricting. And I mean that both literally and figuratively in the sense where it's like one size does not fit all. And, you know, Ashley Graham really helped me free myself. This is a funny story. So Ashley was on the cover, I want to say in 2016 was her Sports Illustrated cover. Mm -hmm. And it came out in the spring of 2016. And then that kind of next year she blew up and she wrote a book and she was going on a book tour. I found out that she was coming to Dallas. I was elated. And I was so jealous you got to meet her. I was like, (laughs) oh my gosh. Yes. So to FaceTime me. I looked into it. And so I went down to Barnes and Noble. My friend came with me. And you had to buy the book that was like your ticket into the line. We're waiting in line. If you can think about a line right now in COVID times, it still like freaks me out that we were all like. Yeah, we were all so close to each other. And she walks in and literally, Alex, this is so embarrassing, but you know how I am. Tears just start forming in my eyes. Because of what she did for me. That's how I'd be if I was in front of Oprah. Oh, I would just sob. That's what I did when I saw Oprah in Your March. Your eyes are literally tearing up right now. It's because Ashley Graham is what I aspire to be with the true confidence. Rooted in true self-love, appreciation, respect for herself, knowing her value and worth. And... You know, for so long, my body was the thing that I wanted to change the most. And it was the thing that I felt was holding me back from confidence. Like, well, Alex, if I just get down to a size two, watch out, guys. Like, then I'm really entering the show. When that's not true. Yeah. Because as we're thinking about it, and this is, I'll just share it here. You know, when I was in high school and I struggled with different body image issues, and I remember I had dropped a lot of weight the summer before my senior year. Yeah. And I got down to probably my lowest. And you want to know what? I still had curves. I still did. Because that's how my body is made. Mm -hmm. And when Ashley Graham finally showed me that when you own that and you own your curves... That's true beauty. Mm -hmm. That's really beautiful. Yeah, and that type of confidence and that type of, like we were talking about in the beginning, like self-awareness and self-assurance and self-belief, it's untouchable. It is. It really, truly, when it is so cultivated within yourself, anything that is on the outside, you truly have control whether you let that come inside of your belief. And I, I, I still struggle with it. I'm not acting like, oh, once I saw Ashley Graham and did that, like, everything changed for me. It didn't. Like, I still have ebbs and flows of this confidence. I don't want to call it a battle because that gives it a negative connotation. It's almost like I, I just need to learn better practices to try to manage that a little bit. Well, I think, and that's the part where we talk about this just within everyday things, is really giving yourself the grace through whatever process you're working through, whether it's confident, whether it's business goals, anything. It's never going to be something that's a destination. It's always something you're cultivating. It's a daily practice. I, I don't remember who said this, but I really believe too, like confidence, well-being, you know, centering yourself. It's like a daily outward decision in an internal practice mm-hmm. every single day. Mm-hmm. And I think that really plays into what you're saying as far as we're never going to be perfectly confident. No. And, you know, as I'm thinking back on the different times of my life when I have felt confident, I think that it was because I was genuinely working towards that. And it was a, you know, conscious decision to say, hey, today I want to show up as who I am, imperfect, whatever. Mm -hmm. And funny enough, because of the times where I'm looking back and I wasn't my most confident self, I think from the outside looking in, it looked easier than it was. Mm -hmm. Because when you are yourself, it's like you're flowing. You're just like, here I am. And you can be honest and you can be truthful and you can be comfortable Mm -hmm. and everything just fits. Yeah. It feels like a flow that you've like harnessed almost. Yeah. And to some degree, I think when you really are in lock with that, to a degree, it does feel effortless. It does. Because you're not putting on a mask every day. You're not putting on a persona or personality that you think other people are going to like. It's it's the intentionality of saying, I'm going to embrace my truth. I'm going to live what feels really, really good. Yeah. And I used to always think, too, I kind of had this misconception about confidence where it was like, hello, everybody. I am here taking up all the space in the room. 
I don't think that is true confidence. What I think true confidence is knowing that you can be present in the room and anybody else could be in there too and they're not going to take away your shine. They're not going to Im- like impend on your sh- your mm-hmm. shine doesn't have to do with anything about theirs. Like mm-hmm. it's you completely shine on independent. Your own. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. That's what I was trying to say. Yeah. Definitely. I think it's it also I think it relates so much to not only like your personal journey, but even in your career setting or in your community or with your friend of you know, group of friends, like it doesn't compete with anybody else. There's this quote and I'm gonna have to find it, but it's like, you know, a flower doesn't compete with the flower next to it, it just blooms. Mm-hmm. And that's what I always try to think about. It's like you have gifts and talents that you're bringing to the world. Mm-hmm. They don't take away anything away from me or anything like that. But, you know, that's why I do think comparison is the thief of joy. And especially with confidence. Because you could be looking at somebody else and say, man, if only I had her money to buy the outfits, mm-hmm. everyone would like me. Mm-hmm. Or if only I did this. But I think especially nowadays, and I got to give credit to Gen Z again because I just think they're helping us all pave the way. Mm-hmm. Gen Z is so unapologetically themselves at times. Yeah, but I think that's set up by the precedence that the generations that came before didn't really have the permission to do that. Why do you think we didn't have the permission? I don't know. I think in some ways it just wasn't the norm. Like, if anything, it was just a standard to kind of go with the flow. Go with what's the society norm, you know? What What is every... I think I was watching a show where it was like the interesting it was a model documentary or something it was talking about how literally the body types yeah were formatted to different different eras you know and i think Twiggy. yeah and 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 i think now for sure like there just doesn't seem to be as many limits yeah you we're know? more accepting of a broader scope yeah and people have more of that permission to really show up and kind of define things for themselves And I I have to give credit to the people who've done that, who've allowed you to do that, because I do think that true confidence is contagious. Yeah. And I think it's something when you see it in the wild, if you would, you're like, what is that? That's beautiful. That's radiant. That's captivating. And it's like, wow. And Glennon Doyle, an incredible author. And if you haven't read Untamed, I highly recommend it. So good. But when she's talking about the fact that she was like, I just decided I didn't want to put Botox on my face anymore. And I didn't want to do this. Mm -hmm. And she was like, I felt so free. I don't have to do it. Like, who told me I had to do it all the time? Yeah. And I loved when she talked about that. And I'm not saying, oh, you know, that's what everyone has to do. It's just like listening to yourself. Like, getting very clear on do you want to dye your hair? Yeah. If you don't, that's cool too. Yeah, definitely. Just even when I think back to when it really clicked for me, what confidence looked like in my life, the pinnacle moment was genuinely, I don't even know if this was just something I thought about, but it was like thinking about what if I just turned down all the voices outside of myself and really listen to like what I want. And what feels good for me and what feels right. In that point where you're looking less on an outside perspective of what to do and who to be and what to wear and, you know, all these different things. We give ourselves an opportunity to really unmask ourselves. And I have to give you credit about that. And when we were probably in high school and college, I really thought about this. You were a role model to me. You were because at times I would look at you. And I know I was hard on you, and I apologize about that. But it was in the sense that you were so comfortable being yourself. And granted, I think that the high school you went to, because we went to two different high schools, definitely allowed you to be more like that. And I'm grateful that they did that for you. But I would look at you, and I'd be like, man, she just doesn't care. And everybody was drawn to you. And I have this clear memory. And it hurts to think about it, but they weren't wrong. And it was this this person who said, like, oh, Alex is the more genuine Stern. And for some time, I had a complex about that. Like, oh, I'm not genuine. And it, I think it was, it was true because at that time, I just wanted so badly to be liked. Being liked was so important to me. Mm. And I still struggle with that, and I'm still working through that. I think everybody wants that, though. I don't think that's wrong for you to want that. It's human. How do you to balance belong. it, then? That's what I'm looking for. Is it is a balance where it says, hey, 
I want to be, and it's a hard word. It's not that I want to be liked. It's I want to feel like I belong. Yeah. A lot of it for me really had to do with the people I was surrounding myself with. All of my friends were very, you know, very comfortable just kind of being their own people. I was... I was friends with people that were in theater. I was friends with people that were on the soccer team and tennis team, I, the football players, the, you know, drill team. Like, I think everybody I was around to some degree was just really chasing their own thing. And they didn't feel the pressure to a degree of needing to be everything for everyone. Yeah. But... Looking at my scenario, you you saw it clearly. When did you think this year you saw, oh, Taylor's coming alive? A lot of it had to do with everybody, I believe, in 2020 really putting their life into perspective. I think we were all kind of in survival mode because every day it was like a different thing was happening, whether it was, you know, a crisis with the pandemic or with, you know, things in the news, anything. Mm Mm-hmm. And when our brains, I think, go into that shift of survival, we're looking at what is the most important thing in our life. And you let go of everything else. Yeah, and you just say, it's kind of like when the building's on fire, what are the things you're going to grab? Yeah. You know? Yeah. And I think that feeling was the same for all of us this year. It was like all of our lives were individually to some degree burning to the ground. And that sounds super dramatic, but... We were dismantling our routines. We were dismantling what we were used to, you know, the norms of our life. And it really forced us or gave us all the opportunity to say, oh my gosh, if that's the case, what am I taking with me when I go? For you, I think it was just seeing the fact that we are such a close family and we're such a tight unit that it was really special to get to spend a lot of time with each other this year And I know that I personally felt like, oh my gosh, why would I ever want to spend another period or season of my life missing out on these moments with the people that mean the very most to me? Just because I'm trying to prove something or I'm, you know, and it's not bad to want things. It's not bad to be ambitious ever because you, we should, I mean, I still are. Yeah. I'm not. Yeah, it's not like you're saying throw away your ambition and just come home to mom and dad. No, not at all. Not at all. Because that's part of who we'll always be. We'll always have these big dreams and wanting to, you know, make change in the world and do good things. And But it really, that's what I think it is truly this year for you is it almost forced you to take off masks. Yeah. Because everybody, I really think, was seen in their rawness. Because I think for the first time, I was able to get clear on what mattered. Yeah. What mattered. And what matters. What what matters to me is going to be different than what matters to you. And I think that's okay. Oh, to every person. Because it's your values. It's your values. And for the first time, I realized what mattered the most to me in this past year was my family. And while I've always been close to my family and I maintained the close relationships, even when I wasn't physically close to them, not knowing the difference of what it means when I'm able to really be around them Mm -hmm. and really see, and as Alex is saying, it's like sharing these special moments with them. My favorite quote of my life, and I've mentioned this before in other episodes, happiness is only real when shared. And that Mm -hmm. was the truth for me. And not to be dramatic, and it kind of goes back to the candle story that I shared in the very first episode, but when you are finally scared to live or at least I felt like I was you realize okay time is pretty finite and you know if I only have this amount of time what do I want to do what do I what do I want my life to look like Mm -hmm. and getting clear on that gave me a lot of freedom for the first time to just say this is me and I feel so confident about what I'm telling you Mm -hmm. and even looking back on like when it was time to walk away from my job it was like I knew that I knew that I wouldn't be happy if I was just doing this for everybody else because I'd felt like I'd done what I wanted to do there. Yeah, and when you're around people that know you the best, like your family or close friends that you know love you no matter what you do in your life, what happens, it helps you to make those brave decisions and to naturally feel more confident 
because you're not having to put on a mask around them. So yeah. you're feeling almost empowered to be who you are. You're feeling empowered to make these competent decisions because you know at the end of the day, too, like those are the people that they're going to be by your side no matter what happens, whether you fail, whether you succeed. It really, I think, a, a huge contributor to, you know, cultivating confidence and nurturing that throughout your life is being super aware of who you're surrounding yourself with. It is. It you is. are who you surround yourself with. I think also recognizing like okay I'm not feeling myself in this moment Mm -hmm. and start to almost like pick apart like why 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 like asking why like it's almost like they have that one exercise where they make you say something and then you go and Mm -hmm. and or like why why and that's what I was doing to myself so it was like okay why do I feel this you know nervousness of coming back to who I am Mm-hmm. And I think that it was because of the fact that I knew deep down inside, like, your story's over here. Like, it's okay to move forward and, and to not necessarily change everything you did, mm-hmm. but to pivot. Yeah, and that plays into the confidence of truly trusting that instinct. Yeah. Because you felt confident in that decision when you tuned out the pressure or the expectations of other people or even maybe that you had set on yourself. And the confidence in that decision was because you were truly looking inward. Andrew East talked about this on the podcast, and we didn't really get a chance to truly dive into it. But he helped me kind of realize something. And we were talking about the fact that this was the first year I was able to spend Thanksgiving with my family. And he was like, yeah, you know, like, how exciting for you. Oh, my gosh, that's awesome. And I was like, yeah, you know, it was super cool when I would get to go to the Thanksgiving games and do all that. And he goes, well, I think there's a difference between happiness and excitement. Mm -hmm. And he was like, yeah, it's super exciting to be at football games and to travel and to do all that. That's very exciting. But true happiness is doing what makes you truly happy. Yeah. And it's not a reaction that it's not a reaction for anybody else to really take part in. Yeah. Or to have commentary on. Yeah. And it's so funny, you know, as I'm thinking about the ways that I've really stepped into it and we're going to share it. Also, the five different ways in a more digestible format on our Thrive in Five this week. It was really starting to look at everything that makes me up. Like, almost like if you look at yourself like Lego blocks Mm -hmm. and you're building yourself up and taking apart each one of those Lego blocks and being like, man, this is so important because if this Lego block wasn't here, I wouldn't be complete. Mm -hmm. And and really honoring it and recognizing it. Mm -hmm. And as I started to do that, I was like, okay, here are the things I truly love to do. Here are the things I truly love about myself. I love conversations. Mm -hmm. You know that. I get jived on like a big conversation. And when I started to do that, it just felt like I was flowing. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, because you're not resisting. You're not resisting anything. It's like, it's, it's following that inner, inner compass. Yeah. And, and really like trusting it and having that true confidence of like, no, I know without a doubt, no matter if it's cool, if it's not whatever, this is in line. Yeah. And yeah. I think overall, whether that is just with, in your case, what we're talking about is a career move, that echoes into everything. That echoes into self-confidence about your appearance, about your abilities. You know, it's it's all, I think, part of a grander collection that adds up to your whole confidence. Yeah, it's kind of like I'm thinking of this one guy I went to high school with. He was just cool. And I'm not going to say his name because I don't want to put him on blast, but I do want everyone to know the person that he is in my eyes. And he was this guy, and he just wore what he wanted to wear. He drove the car he wanted to drive, and he was so cool. And he was almost like the leader of this whole cool group Mm -hmm. because he just was out there. And I know you've heard it a million times of like, oh, you know, it's better to stand out in a crowd, blah, blah, blah. But that's still very difficult because when you stand out, suddenly you're alone. Mm -hmm. It could be isolating. So what I've realized now, and I was talking to dad about this the other day, Mm -hmm. giving yourself a parachute where you know you're going to jump out of this plane, but how can you have the parachute to reassure you that you're not going to fall? Mm. Does that make sense? So it's almost like if you're about to either make a decision, make a big step or something, decide whatever big in your life, that voice that's like, oh, you can't do it. You can't do it. You're not you're not enough or you won't be able to do it. It's like the parachute is that reminder. Yeah. Hey, 
Yeah, exactly. I am confident in this. I can do this. I am capable. I am worthy. Yes. Yeah, that's, that's cool. why I, I think when I talked about set, letting go of the – or starting the by wins, mm-hmm. it's giving yourself that, like, okay, I'm going to take this step. I don't have to rush out this front door right now and take the step right now. I'm going to give myself this allotted amount of time. Mm-hmm. It's a personal deadline of mine, and then I can go. Mm-hmm. But it's also, like you said, getting the right people around you who say, you can do it. Yeah. I know you can do it. Yeah. You are beautiful the way you are. But I also want to touch on something that you, I think you even said this last week, where we were talking about, oh, all these pressures of, you know, the new year and making resolutions and feeling like all these people are posting about, oh, this year I really want to like get on this new fitness plan or, you know, there's just so much pressure and it's exhausting. And you talked about how What if, you know, what if we could all do ourselves kind of a favor where it's like, hey, what if I don't have to wait till that certain time to be confident? Letting go of the when I statements. Yeah. So instead of saying when I get this car, when I get this job, when I get this, when I lose this weight. When when my hair looks better. When I'm. When I have clear skin. Yeah. When I meet those fitness goals at the gym or. it's like Also putting a codependency thing is when you're like, oh, when I. When I get this boyfriend yeah. or that. And it's like, no, girl, you're good on your own. And I'm saying that to myself. I'm literally speaking that to me. Yeah. Um, because for so long, though, it, it's almost like it gives you a little bit of like this like, well, guys, like I know I'm this imperfect person, but like don't you worry when I get the perfect X, Y, and Z, mm-hmm. everything will change for me. Mm-hmm. And that's not true. Yeah, because I think that – we're talking about that in the sense of how that relates to both of us, where we've both seen, I mean, being sisters, we both watch each other go through different seasons of our lives where we've had different insecurities, whether it was about, you know, our body, t- body image, you know, struggles or anything or career frustrations. Uh, it really is, you know, it's, it's not about chasing that destination because the, the true confidence and the worthiness is, it's not an ultimatum. It's not something that's on the other side of a finish line waiting for you uh, because we've both met some finish lines we wanted to get to and we've been like, wait, why do I not – why did the fireworks not go off? Yeah. Why do I not suddenly have my confidence that I felt like I fought for? Yeah. It's something we don't need to put this ultimatum of. Well, and what you bring up is when you do that – when you strive for something to give you happiness or to give you confidence, what happens is is that you you get it, and I'm I'm going to use myself as as an example with the Forbes 30 under 30. So I worked to get the Forbes 30 under 30, and not necessarily just for the award, but if you think about why I got the award, it was because I was doing all this work. And so when I got it, it was like, okay, this is great, but what's the next thing? What's the next award I can apply yeah, for? Yeah, it's almost like an unattainable hunger that. Yeah, it's like piling everything on top of each other. It's like, yeah. okay, I've lost 10 pounds. Could I lose 15? Or in social media, too. Okay. I got a thousand likes. Yeah, or maybe the next picture, people have this many comments. Or, oh, I want this amount of followers by the end of the year. And again, like you said, it doesn't mean that you're not allowed to have these goals. Like, it doesn't mean that you're not allowed to strive for these things or want to, you know, grow or evolve but it's just not attaching confidence or happiness to those things because they're so fickle. Yeah. I love, there's this one TikTok trend and I really love it. And it's like, okay. And it's a voiceover type thing. And it's like, okay, I know you're upset that your TikTok only got 200 views, Mm -hmm. but what would you do right now if 200 people literally came into your room and were watching you do what you do? Like, Mm -hmm. that is a lot of people. And for some reason, the scale has been blown out of proportion. Because we see, you know, these celebrities that are these crazy numbers. We don't realize how impactful. The capacity of that. Yeah. And that's where I think coming back, true confidence and owning who you are also has a lot to do with intention. Mm -hmm. Making sure that everything you're doing has a bigger intention. Mm -hmm. Not bigger. Let me retort or is that the right word here? Retort my phrase. I'm saying true confidence and owning who you are has a lot to do with intention. Mm-hmm. So if you say, 
I'm intentionally wanting to feel comfortable today as I work. Mm -hmm. And you decide that you're going to get dressed up or you're going to, and by dressed up, I mean jeans and a sweater. I'm not talking fancy gear. Mm -hmm. Instead of what you wore yesterday, which was sweats and a sweatshirt, because you want to feel good in your soul. Mm -hmm. You're not necessarily dressing up for other people. And I get that sometimes because for me, something I've become very clear on is that I feel very confident when I take the time to take care of myself. Mm-hmm. And some days that looks different. Some days that's washing my hair. <laughs> some days that's... Wearing a pair of jeans versus sweatpants. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So while on the outside that might look like, oh, she's being vain, she's getting dressed. No, I've gotten very clear with myself that this genuinely brings me comfort. Yeah, it's a self-practice that for you, it really does add to a type of internal confidence. Because yes. ultimately right now during the season where we're all quarantining, who who's going to see that? <laughs> like, yeah. we're not leaving our houses. So it's, it's really something you're doing for yourself. Yeah. Yeah, it is. So anyway, we will talk more about this, but let's get to the Jenna Sims conversation. Jenna Sims is a friend of mine. She's a model, actress, philanthropist, and after years of competing in pageants and actually winning the Miss Georgia Teen USA, she formed Pageant of Hope in 2004, which is crazy to think because she was still in high school when she created this awesome nonprofit. I wanted to talk to her about it and learn more about it, especially this year during COVID and how she was able to adapt and still make it special for everyone. So what Pageant of Hope is, is this, its mission is to empower, celebrate, and advocate for children facing challenges, celebrating inner beauty and self-confidence. The Pageant of Hope has traveled to 16 states as well as six international regions, including Australia, South Africa, Cuba, the Bahamas, and Jamaica. They've crowned thousands of children, teenagers, and adults, helping the participants to realize their own inner beauty and shine in front of family and friends for unforgettable experience. So here is our conversation with Jenna Sims. So how do you build confidence? just it takes time it's like something as a kid like especially with Instagram and social media it's there's so much comparison and comparison is the thief of joy as they say I think being confident is just being sure of you have you're the body that you know God gave you and just once you can accept that what you have is what you're going to have the rest of your life and just accept that fact then I think that's where confidence comes because it's not about being the most beautiful in the room or the most intelligent in the room or the most successful in the room. I think confidence is just being sure of who you are. Tell us more about your nonprofit. What is it exactly? Because I mean, when I was researching it and looking at it and we've, you know, talked about it, I mean, it's a really beautiful event and I'm just curious where that stemmed from because I didn't know you started it that young even. So I started the pageant of hope in 2004, actually. So I was in high school. Um, Prior to that, I had lost um, both my grandfathers to cancer. And I was doing, you know, Relay for Life, like with the American Cancer Society. It's a big like cancer um, event every year they have. And I like I would see I was able to interact. I did a few like hospital visits and I got to interact with these kids. And I was like, I really, really want to do something where I can bring the kids to me. And at that time I was already doing pageants and I had won a pageant by that point. And I was like, the feeling, I just kind of put two and two together. Like the feeling of winning a pageant, like at the time I felt that it changed my life and it kind of did because it sort of put my career, like I figured out my trajectory from that point forward. But I wanted to give children who wouldn't normally compete in pageants that winning feeling And the only way to do that was to create a pageant where every single kid won. (laughs) And so we do, you know, they come in, they do their hair, their makeup, the nails. We do like, I teach them the pageant walk and we put on a whole entire pageant and we have like, you know, a celebrity panel of judges and they determine, you know, who wins like the titles, like the titles are like best hair, best smile, most confident. We come up with a title and we award every single person Um, a title and then they get a crown they get a sash a little certificate they get all those great things and then it's also a good event for the parents because parents 
of these children, you know, they can obviously network with each other and they can make friends that way, but they don't get to go to soccer games. They don't get to go to, you know, the dance recitals and all that. So the pageant is a way for the parents to even have the opportunity to, you know, bring flowers, they make posters, they take pictures, they clap and they're so proud. Like it's also a big event for the parents. And I've held, oh my gosh, I've lost count now, but I've been to some amazing places with that. I've been to South Africa twice. I've been to Australia, Cuba. We went to Ukraine of all places. <laughs> um, and then every year we try to go to Nassau, but we weren't able to go this year because the village we work with down there, it's called Gambier Village. They, they're shut down right now. Um, but yeah, other than, I guess I, I'm kind of voicing this as a pageant for children with cancer. That's how it started. But we've since since branched out to a pageant for children with challenges. So it's, you know, special needs, um, you know, disabilities. Uh, We went to a village that was predominantly like an AIDS village in South Africa. And um, it's a pageant for kids who wouldn't normally compete in pageants. Is there a moment that you see within a child where it's like a light switch that, because I know you're- time. What is it like? Every single one of them. I- I think, I I mean, I need to get like, look back at numbers. I've crowned probably 5,000 kids, easy. Um, They all, all of them, give or take a few, come in glued to their mom's leg or their dad's like holding them and they're like shaking. And they see like, my team, we're all former pageant winners. So they see this like lineup of like beautiful girls and we're all like, come in. Like, we're so excited to have you. And, you know, I have it down like, we all split up. Like I do walk. I have a girl that does the makeup, a girl on the nails, a girl in the hair. So we kind of like rotate them through sort of uh, an assembly line of beautification. Yeah. And they, if we can just get them to sit down and talk with one of our girls, they slowly start to open up. But when they go through every single station and at the end, and they like see themselves in the mirror, they just light up. They're like, Oh, Oh, and there, their shoulders go back and they learn how to pose. And then, so we do like a walk through in the, be- like in the beginning where I do the pageant walk with them. I hold their hand and I like twirl them around and teach them poses, which is just like silly. Like some of them want to dance. I'm like, you go, you do that dance. Um, so once they get, if I can just get them on the stage, which I always get every single person on the stage, um, one time and they see, they kind of get that feel for like walking across the stage, they just light up. Like they just do. And, um, I guess one really cute story, this kid, um, Ryan, who, um, has since passed away, but he was at my very first pageant. He had neuroblastoma, which gosh, I think it's cancer of the nerves. It's been a while since I've studied up on my childhood for his cancer. <laughs> there are a lot of them um, but he had a bald head because he was still going through the chemo and it was right before he was going on stage and he kind of latched on to me like each of these kids sort of like latch on to like a different girl uh, on my team but he kind of latched on to me and he like tugged on my dress and he like looked up and he was like Jenna like how does my hair look and I was like Oh, you look amazing, obviously. And he was cracking a joke about his lack of hair. And he just thought it was so funny because he saw the girls all getting their hair done and just seeing like he came in so shy and just seeing how he just came out of his shell and how happy he was like that made me just want to keep on, you know, keep on going with it. But I get letters, I get letters from or emails and Facebook messages from from the parents or from the kids themselves just saying like, I never take my crown off. I wear my crown to school or I'm teaching my friends at school, the pageant walk. Like it definitely leaves like a lasting, lasting impact. And I get all like, when can you come back, you know, to my town and do another pageant? And I'm like, Oh, I wish I could. (laughs) I know. I know. What are you doing this year? Uh, I know you mentioned there was still something regardless of Corona. Yes. So And if anyone is listening has access to other, you know, schools, hospitals that we could do this with, I have plenty, plenty more to do, but we are doing for, so when we go to Nassau every year, we kind of work with the same group of kids. So they're, they're fully aware of like what the pageant of hope is. And every year we kind of add sort of something to it. Like last year we made like a full weekend out of it. And we did the first day we taught, we did like a little seminar on like inner beauty and we like had them decorate mirrors with like 
these little wooden mirrors and they wrote like words around the mirrors of like what inner beauty means to them. And so we did that, but that actually has nothing to do with what we're doing. We are doing, um, a, no, it does. Pageant. Yeah. It actually does kind of tie in. We're doing pageant in a box. So we are sending individual, I got these gorgeous boxes that I'm like so thrilled about, um, pageant of hope boxes. And in them is everything you need to have a pageant for yourself at your house. So I'm sending like a little makeup kit, a little thing in nail polish, the sash, the crown, um, a disposable camera that we're all going to hopefully try to get them all back. <laughs> um, so we're sending in instructions on how to have a pageant in your home. So it's very Corona friendly since they're not allowed to leave, you know, their areas or whatever. So we are doing pageant in a box. That's amazing. I love that. I freaked out when you said the mirrored thing. I was actually talking about that with Alex the other day, because there's something about being a mirror and you said it, the mirror moment, um, when they see themselves, um, even though it's all exterior of what you were doing, you know, but they finally see themselves inside of who they can be. Yes. We, we explain, like we say, like, what does inner beauty mean to you? And they sort of start thinking and they're like, being nice to others and, you know, being respectful. Like we kind of just ask them what inner beauty means to them. And we explain that you can't be beautiful on the outside until you're beautiful on the inside. And so we have them write all the, the words about what, what inner beauty means to them, like on the mirror when they do the rhinestones and the glitter. And then that's sort of kind of the full circle on that. And then the makeup, yeah. I mean, we definitely have fun with it because it's still a pageant at the end of the day. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think when they see themselves with like purple eyeshadow and hot pink blush, just something happens. <laughs> you know, they're yeah. like, oh, and they start saying like, I am beautiful. And even if they didn't think they were beautiful before, they know they're beautiful now. Even if it's just some glitter on the lips, they're like, wow, look how sassy I am and they just kind of come alive and that that's where the confidence comes from yeah what would be your best advice or you know tangible tips that people can do to work on self-love inner beauty confidence like what is the thing that sticks with you when you're struggling a little bit because it's I think it's something you have to constantly work at it oh my god and it's I it is something that you definitely kind of it's kind of like going to the gym like I was explaining to my therapist the other day um I went I missed like maybe a month and I haven't I hadn't done that and I and since I've been seeing this lady um and I felt like I I came in there and I was like I feel just so like out of practice she's like what are you talking about I was like I need I still need to do my I feel like I haven't been to the gym like you know how if you haven't gone to the gym in a few months you just feel a little different you feel like softer and I was like I feel soft coming in here right now I need to talk to you um but I think if you can't if therapy is not your thing like that is definitely I'm gonna give a large amount of credit to that because that's how I'm working on myself you know self-love you can you can only read so many inspirational quotes that's not how you do it I think when you actually work on yourself and learn and really just go through like self-forgiveness and forgiveness of others that's a big um but if therapy's not your thing I think getting into I got into Gabby Bernstein books she's amazing her um I, I didn't love the the 40 day one because I I like a binge listen where her her 40 day thing was you know like 20 minutes every single day and that I don't know. I, I did make it through the end of it. That didn't do it for me. The, the may cause miracles is my favorite one. And I, I took notes on that one. And sometimes if I'm just feeling a little like in my head or, you know, if I'm in my stories, which is even therapy talk, but I, I kind of read through some of my notes from that book, or I'm actually thinking about just listening to it again. Cause you kind of just feel, she says like things here and there that I really like latch on to and it's all about just changing your thoughts, like really just changing how you talk to yourself. And once you can just yeah. change the way you speak to yourself, it just changes your whole mental mindset. Yeah, And you're so right. I love that you said that that one's the one that stuck mm-hmm. out to you or stood out to you. I can't speak <laughs> sometimes. And you took mm-hmm. notes because that's part of working is like getting it out of your head. Like, I think sometimes when I feel like I've been at my lowest or I think back on it, it's like I was in my Mm -hmm. head and I was just all up in here and no one understood what I was going through. I isolated myself. I was very much 
um, misunderstood and no one really got what this was. And that's a whole lot of jumble. But what I was saying is that when I started to release it in some form or fashion, whether it be going to therapy, whether it be journaling, whether it be um, just kind of like doing prompts, prompts really Mm -hmm. helps me. Like if I start thinking about something and then it was out of me and I could look at it and see it like, okay, here's why I'm feeling this way or and then you start to understand. And once you understand, you have confidence. Yeah. It's like, I'm terrible at math, <laughs> absolutely terrible at math. And anytime I would do math in school, at first when I would see it, I had zero mm-hmm. confidence. But when I worked at it, worked at it, to ask the teacher, is this how you do it? Mm-hmm. What is this? And I better understood it. It was like something clicked. And then I was like, anybody want to know that, <laughs> you know, Pythagorean theorem? So like, squared plus I got the knowledge over here. Yep. <laughs> Math nerd. Exactly. <laughs> that's oh my gosh. I envy that. Like, oh, I was and, that. but that's when I felt the confidence. Yeah. No, it's, uh, that's what anything. And, and my big thing in, in therapy was, um, confrontation like I used to be so scared of it and I I like your math thing I was so not confident with not and not, it's not even like an argument but it was just if something was bothering you just speaking up about it like scared the absolute shit out of me and I think in the beginning I was working on it so say if Brooks said something that made me feel a certain type of way I would be like so scared I, I would preface it by being like Brooks you know I'm working on this so let me say what I'm about to say <laughs> and now I think just practicing it over and over I'm like ready to go like I'm not I'm not like yeah. Mike Tyson yet but I feel a lot more confident with confronting people about things even in my friendships like if a friend does something I'll, I'll be like that was really shitty like let's let's talk about that you know you made me feel this and let's you know work through this so prior yeah. to actually working on myself I, I would just let everything just roll off or I'd be the pushover like it's fine like that was the like the, my thing like oh it's okay but now I'm like no it's not okay like no what you did was bad let's let's you know let's talk about it um yeah I, I love mm-hmm. that and I think another thing circling back on like your journaling and you know getting your thoughts out I I, like just a tip for anyone, you know, who needs one, a big thing for me, if I'm getting into my head about something, or if you have like a repetitive thought, that's like a negative thought. Like if I'm dreading something that's coming up, like sometimes the holidays like really stress me out because my, my families are, um, are not together. And growing up, it was kind of hard to sort of balance all that. So I kind of get triggered, (laughs) um, this time of year. And then my birthday is coming. It's like a whole lot. December is always like a lot for me and so if I start like it's not even it's November 19th like if I start thinking about Christmas now like what am I going to get Brooks for Christmas like stresses me out because I haven't even thought about it I'll say you know what that you know a big what what, what do I say thanks for reminding me I'm gonna let that go like that's a big one like that's that's my mental sort of conditioning of like thanks for reminding me this does not serve me right now I'm gonna let that go like I'm going to be present where I'm at right now. And that actually does help me like the feeling of like stress and anxiety. It kind of does go away. If I can just remind myself that it doesn't matter right now, you know, I'll deal with it. Grounding. Yes. Yourself. Like that's a yeah. big one. Like, like, thanks for reminding me. I'm going to let that go. <laughs> that is like a big one. I need to tattoo it on my forehead. <laughs> Jenna's great, and I'm so excited that they were still able to do something this year for those kids because I loved her story about Ryan. That's mm, really such a good one. That's really special. And we're going to go ahead and we're going to link all of her information and Pageant of Hopes below. So if you want to learn more or donate, that will be in the show notes of this show. But Al, I just wanted to wrap this episode up and also touching on what Jenna talks about and saying that owning who you are, having true confidence, self-belief, this is all a journey. Mm -hmm. It's not a destination. It's not something that you're going to just feel every day. Not everybody has the right answer. Not everybody has the right answer. And so I think the biggest thing is focusing on how you can create a healthy relationship with Mm self-doubt, knowing it's going to be present. Mm -hmm. And that's okay. Don't yep. shame yourself makes for that. Human. It makes you human. And just continuing to show up as you are, knowing you always have worth and value. Hey. 
Hey, are you loving this show? Well, I'd love to hear from you. Head on over to your podcast app, scroll down to where it says ratings and reviews, and I'd love to hear your thoughts with a rating and review. Your words might just be what the next person needs to tune in and turn their purpose into passion.